Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, everybody. Welcome again to Think Tech Tourism 101. I'm Mufi Hanman. Our guest today is Rick Egan, the president of the Waikiki Improvement Association, an organization that dedicates itself to preserving and enhancing the way of life, improving uh, the way of life, I should say, in Waikiki for our residents, our employees, and of course, the visitors that come to Waikiki. Rick, welcome to our show. Good morning, Mufi. Thank you for inviting me. You know, um, there's so many things to talk about because you and I go way back. Uh, and uh, certainly we've had a lot of experiences, but I need to ask you the proverbial local school question. So, what high school are you in? I come from beneath the waving tassels of Waipahu High. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's always a great question to ask of Rick because no one can believe that he actually went to Waipao. Explain that. Well, we, we lived in Pearl City, and uh, in those days there was no Pearl City High School. And so I uh, took the bus to Waipahu High School every day. And um, uh, it was interesting because Waipahu was kind of the local school in the area. And uh, um, a lot of them, there was a lot of military kids would come in and they'd take one look at the student body and they'd transfer to Radford or Campbell or Lelehua. Um, but I just enjoyed it and I stayed there. So I think I was one of like about a half a dozen Howleys in my senior class. Wow, you really stood out there. I did. Yeah. Well, I can tell you folks that uh, Rick hasn't forgotten his roots. In fact, he and I, along with other visitor industry stakeholders, are working very hard. And uh, the principal, who I think is one of the best in the state, Keith Hayashi, Waipao High School, you know, when Governor Ige talks about early college education, uh, it really started at Waipao High School. It's a very innovative principal. And so, uh, Rick, being a graduate of uh, Waipao High School, is helping us uh, work with them to kind of enhance their uh, tourism academy and culinary academy. So. Great things to talk about that in, in coming shows, but today it's all about Rick Eggett uh, and what he does uh, in Waikiki. Uh, Rick, you've had an uh, outstanding career uh, in terms of uh, the kind of jobs that you've held, everything from uh, being a director of the Office of State Planning uh, to being a deputy director at DBID, working with uh, some tall guy uh, as yes. the director back then. <laughs> Tell us about some of the, the highlights of that and how that has prepared you for this very important job that you have now as the head of the Waikiki Improvement Association. Well, when I, um, I started with the state, I actually uh, first worked under Murray Tell when he was the director there. And then Murray... Also a former president of the Hawaii Hotel Association. He then left that job to go to the Hotel Association. And that's when we got our new director. M Mufi came in, moved over from the Office of International Relations. And uh, so that began a, a great uh, partnership. I think we worked really well together as director and uh, we deputy. Did. And uh, then from there, um, Seiji Naya came in during the, in the next administration, which was the Governor Caetano's administration. And um, because it, it was uh, uncertain whether he was going to, whether Caetano was going to win that election, you might remember it was kind of close, um, the legislature had budgeted down, there was instead of the three deputies that you had, there, were only, there was only one under Caetano. So I was the single deputy. And I remember one of the things I, re I remember from, from that is so I, when I first sat down with Seiji, I said to him, so, so, so I said, how often do you, do you want to meet? I says, you know, with, with Murray Towell, it was once a month. With Mufi, it was once a week. Uh, how often do you want to get together? He goes, every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, one deputy. <laughs> <laughs> so we not only met every day, but most days we actually met in the morning to talk about our day, and in the evening to talk about what happened during the day. So um, it was a good. He was a good boss too. He was. And, he was a great man. Uh huh. And uh, it's really sad that he's gone. He's left us. Yeah. But uh, in, and then you did the office of state planning. So then I went to the office of state planning from there on, under Caetano because one of the major things that uh, he he wanted me to engineer really was the Barber Point Barber's Point conversion. Uh, so we needed a plan a, a, um, that would cover what was going to take place in Barbers Point. And one of our key objectives was to maintain the second airport there because we wanted to take some of the, the small plane traffic out of Honolulu International. And we had to, and you're very, um, you're, you're very uh, Akamai in this area too, but we needed to build a plan that also had a lot of benefit to the community because yes. the community, it's a sacrifice for the community to have an airport in the community because you have planes overhead of it all the time so we wanted to make sure that we built into the plan uh, a lot of community benefit 
And then we also uh, were, one of the objectives I think of every administration of, in recent times has been to uh, build up the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And so a lot of the land was also allocated to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. So uh, it, it's been slow going. I think we engineered a good plan. The problem is nobody's ever really put enough money into it to make it work the way it was supposed to. But hopefully over time that'll happen. You know, Rick is being very modest here because he's glossing over something that he was the point person for when I was the director of DBED. <coughs> and that was the whole Hawaiian Airlines situation. Governor Waihe'e uh, at that time was very concerned. Uh, about uh, Hawaiian Airlines was having some financial problems. And so uh, Rick and I huddled in our once a week meetings. And that time I think we, it was like every day we were talking about this issue. Yes, yes, yes. Because it was very important. Uh -huh. And uh, we came up with a loan guarantee program uh, that mm -hmm. really staved off the creditors and allowed Hawaiian Airlines to kind of regroup. Uh, we worked, uh, uh, and uh, you know, it was a kind of strong positive message that the state would guarantee uh, its existence. And, and Rick was point person. Uh, on, on that particular, so I need to make sure that people know. Uh, that was a very for work for that was a very interesting project. We learned a lot about how airlines were run, exactly, and um, and how little they actually have in terms of real assets. It's mm -hmm. their it's their business that is the asset, really. And when it comes down to it, when you look at what Hawaiian Airlines has done for the state since then, I, I'm as you as you pointed out, I, I'm really happy that we worked so hard to keep them alive. And it was interesting because at the time, Aloha Airlines was strong and That's Hawaiian right. Airlines was weak. The situation later reversed. Right. But uh, the, uh, I think the result of keeping Hawaiian Airlines in business has uh, just reaped a lot of rewards for, yeah. the, for the state of Hawaii. And it wasn't just a, uh, a matter of um, propping up a, a weak business. I think that they needed that time, uh, the business plan, the business model was uh, valid. Uh, it's just that um, they needed a break from their creditors. It was The loan guarantee was never actually executed. Yep, never actually but the executed. fact that the, the loan guarantee was there bought them the time they needed with their creditors. And as a result, they were able to uh, come back strong. That was the beauty of it. And kudos to <clears throat> Governor Wahe and also Mitch Dolier, who was running Hawaiian Airlines at that time. Mm -hmm. It's great to work with. So, Rick, let's talk about uh, this present job of Waikiki Improvement Association. Um, for the person listening that may not know a whole lot about your organization, why don't you drill down on the mission of WIA and uh, how long you've been there? Well, WIA was created back in 1967, and it was really created as a reaction by the business community to the rapid development that was taking place in Waikiki at the time. And um, as a result, uh, they were concerned that it was very haphazard, that there was no real planning or zoning going on. And, uh, as a, and the, what came out of that originally was the Waikiki Special District uh, at the time. Uh, and the whole idea was to try to channel that growth in a more uh, positive way than the, just the, hap, like I said, the haphazard pash, uh, fashion that it had taken to date. Um, I think it was, in the end, we found out uh, that a lot of those efforts, well-intentioned though they were, were kind of stifling because they tried to force uh, the reality of business development into you know, a theoretical uh, best case. And as a result, um, after that time from 1976 um, when the WSD went into place, uh, it was a, there was about 30 years where almost no major redevelopment took place in Waikiki. Uh, at the time, it, nobody really worried about it because there had been so much development up to that point. But after 30 years, everything was really grinding down. Yeah. And that's when I think uh, our paths crossed again because I was on the council at that time and we said, you know what, we need to revitalize this area here. And I always point to Lure Street. Uh, as how it used to look, and thanks to the amendments that we made to the Waikiki Special District Design, mm -hmm. uh, I was the planning chair of the council at the time. Uh, we said, basically said in, in, in layman's term is, allow them to go up to create more open space on the bottom, right. which is why you see that lovely beach walk now that the Outrigger Hotels uh, uh, Resorts has been. I always, always remember one of the big issues at that time was the Waikiki was in such bad shape. There was some uh, clamoring to create another HCDA type setup That's in right. Waikiki. And I remember this very clearly when the debate was before the, the city council and there were some people who were really being obstacles, won't mention any names. And, um, and you stood up there and you said, you know, if we can't get this done, 
then we've abdicated our responsibility. The state should take it. And I think that was, that was the turning point. I really think it was, because I think everybody realized they needed to come to a compromise and uh, move the bill forward, which it did. And it was really the beginning of um, you know, the, uh, what we call the revitalization of Waikiki. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, WIA itself, your board of directors, uh, your membership. You know, last night uh, had a wonderful, wonderful again, uh, another uh, annual meeting of yours. And uh, you know, lots of people came out, uh, a lot of energy in there, and then you also give out annual awards. Uh, and they were beaming with pride. Bonnie Kiabo of the, the Hyatt, for example, said, I not only won one, we won two awards for my resort. That's Talk right. about some of that. Yeah, that was terrific. Um, Hyatt won both a, a green award because they had been doing so much to, to uh, build uh, recycling and earth-friendly activities into their operations. They also won a cultural award because uh, they hired one of the great ladies, a good friend of you and I both, uh, Kuipo Kumukahi. Absolutely. Uh, multiple um, uh, no, no, no Hoku award winner. And uh, the, uh, uh, she has just created a, a tremendous cultural program at Hyatt. They're also one of the sponsors of the Kuhu Beach Hula program. That was something that had, that had gotten started um, actually when I was still at DBED. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it, was, it came out of the Waikiki Improvement Association. And originally, the, and then the city kind of took it over. In fact, uh, I think, um, was it during your administration? We took it up to every day for a while. Yes, we did. Uh, it's down to three times a day because we were always battling budget crunches, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, some, um, I remember a mayor who ran on this. Nice, we have to do what we have to do, not to, what we, what is it, what's the term? I said we need to do need to have rather than need nice to, have, to have. Nice to have, right, that's the term. <laughs> and so um, a lot of the things ended up um, working out differently. But, you know, I appreciate the fact. Pri private sector partners. You did, right. I mean, for example, Sunset on the Beach, uh, which was a, a great idea. And, you know, there are some, some uh, administrations that come in and then they just want to do everything different than the other administration. And instead, I think you came in and you decided you, we were going to do things better. Yeah. You know, and in the old administration, uh, the sunset on the beach was run right out of the managing director's office. Right. And then when you came in, we partnered yeah. on it, and you brought in private sector sponsors as opposed to city money. Right. And uh, it's still alive. It's limping along. Mm -hmm. We're looking for a longer-term sponsor. Maybe if uh, we get some um, changes going forward, we'll get that done. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, you know, and, and that's such an important part of uh, what you do at WIA. Uh, certainly, I talked about the way of life, the quality of life. Uh, but. <clears throat> What I want to get to uh, when we take a little break, of pause for the cause, if you will, I want to come back and talk about some of the specific projects uh, that you are working on each and every day that's making a difference in people's lives. Some of them what we call low-hanging fruit, others are high-hanging fruit, uh, and it's going to take some time. But I think the key of it is you working with organizations such as ours, Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, VASH, um, HVCB, all the Waikiki stakeholders, HTA, uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page. And as I said earlier in the pro at the outset of the program, it's not just for the visitors that come there. We're very much concerned about the residents uh, as well as the workers. So we're going to take a short pause now for the cause. And when we come back, we've got Rick Eggett here, who is the president of the Waikiki Improvement Association. Uh, every time there's an issue about Waikiki, you can bet that Rick Eggett will be at the forefront of it because that's what he does. And what's nice about it, despite all these years that he's been there, he's still very passionate and excited as if it were his first day on the job. <laughs> we'll be back uh, after this break. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. 
We're back again with uh, Rick Egan, proud graduate of White Powell High School here, <laughs> president of the Waikiki Improvement Association. Thank you, Mufi. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, when we came into 2018, one of our big issues was we'd had some, uh, and it kind of was brought to the fore just recently because we had another incident, some fairly high profile um, cr criminal activities that took place in Waikiki. Uh, and, you know, we're always concerned because one of the major uh, pluses for our destination is the low crime rate. And so when you have these high profile incidents take place, you know, you want to make sure you jump on it right away so that you can maintain public confidence in, in the public safety. And uh, you kind of brought a reprise of a, something that, we had, that you had done mm -hmm. uh, like 20 years before. And we created a public safety conference. And I say we because you were the chair, our council member Trevor Ozawa was the co-chair, um, but then also Waikiki Improvement Association, the Waikiki Business Improvement District Association, yes. and I think VASH, too. Oh, VASH. VASH too. We, were, we all worked together in creating this conference. I think one of the major things that we did was, was you did, was bring the military involved because the military personnel have been involved in a lot of these major incidents. And, um, and a lot of good, I think, uh, has come out of that uh, work. On, um, we also involved a lot of the business establishments that kind of were in the prosecutor's this office. Center of this. Oh, and Keith Kunishiro in the prosecutor's yeah. office, absolutely. And, uh, and HPD, HPD, of course. Always H HPD. HPD was involved in a major way. So, we're, so we brought all these major stakeholders together. And um, one of the things that's, that's already in motion that's, that's definitely making... Uh, when you say the low-hanging fruit, but the city, HTA, and the Business Improvement District Association have come together to fund additional cameras for Waikiki. We have, first of all, we have 10, but they weren't all working, so now all 10 are working, and uh, there's a phase two that's, gonna, that's already been funded, so they're already gonna begin the progress of, of uh, putting additional security cameras around Waikiki. And I think that security cameras make a huge difference in terms of being a deterrent to crime, helping us to solve crimes, getting on them right away. And I think HPD does a terrific job of doing that, you know, jumping on all these crimes and making sure that the, that the perpetrators are um, immediately brought to justice. Uh, prosecuting attorney's office uh, prioritizes making sure that they pay for their crimes. So I think that uh, we, we, the system is not broken, right. but it definitely needs uh, you know, enhancements, mm -hmm. and that's what we concentrated on. Yeah, and we're going to continue to do this going forward. We said that we didn't want this to be uh, a one-time confab that we bring people together. Uh, we're continuing to dialogue. We have a committee that's in place, uh, and can't say enough about the wonderful support that's been given by Chief Ballard and Deputy Chief McCarthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, we want everybody engaged all the way. And as you mentioned, the military, uh, and one of the new ideas that we brought to the forefront is getting a youth group. Uh, in Waikiki, uh, and in particular the Adult Friends for Youth, right? because there's a lot of young people that are coming into Waikiki, and because of their interaction with the high schools and dealing with many of these troubled youth, they're able to identify who they are and serve as additional eyes and ears uh, to help the police department. I think, I mean, it wasn't, it, it didn't take um, a genius to figure out that one of our big problems, in, in each of these major incidents, we had a lot of uh, underage people involved in, in, the, in the problem. And so it was clear, there was clear that there's something need to be addressed there. And I think that Chief Ballard, as soon as she came in, one of the things she did was reactivated a, a I'm not sure the terminology for it, a youth division, basically, that worked with uh, mm -hmm. different uh, uh, youth gangs right. and problem youths that are at-risk youth, maybe yeah. a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was um, really uh, impressed mm -hmm. during that conference yeah. when we heard all of the programs that were in place to address uh, at rescue. Yeah, and of course, this augments the ambassadors of the law and the WBID mm -hmm. uh, and the fine work that they do. So, yes, Chris, uh, Rick is right. We need to be vigilant about crime. Uh, that's one of the features of why people come to Hawaii because they feel it's a safe and secure destination. So, we can never let our guard down. So, let's talk about some other things that are happening um, uh, with respect to your responsibilities. Uh, you know, we, we've seen some near scares of major. Uh, man, natural disasters uh, that really would have wreaked havoc on Waikiki, and uh, you have been at the forefront of some of these issues, in particular with the Alawai. Let's talk about that. Okay, uh, that's one of my favorite issues, as you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rick Alawai Egan. <laughs> so, but the 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 key is, uh, and I and one of the things that we've done, uh, and it's, we've actually been doing it for about a couple of years now, is we created what, what we call the Alawai Collaboration. 
and uh, your uh, organization's part of that. Uh, but all the major stakeholders, uh, Kamehameha Schools, the university, um, the city, both the city and state sit at the table. Uh, and what the Alawai Association, Alawai Watershed Association, Karen Amai is an old friend of mine. And uh, the, 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 I think that the, the issue is that we want to work together as a community. And we partially actually did it when the, the Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. flood control plan rolled out. Um, because we were all uh, concerned that if we're going to spend that much money on, on the Alawai, we want to do more than just get flood control. Well, flood control is obviously critical. Uh, if we had received the, the impact of rain that they, they, they uh, were hit with on Kauai and on the Big Island, it would, we would still be getting rid of the water. <laughs> That's how bad the situation could be. And, and then we, but, but the, one of the major uh, points of the collaboration is it's not just the, the flood control issue, it's the water quality and the environment. And uh, one of the problems, one of the, it, you know, and it, there's a lot of things that you can do, and some of them are in the Army Corps plan, some of them need to be doing, done in addition, that can address the situation. But the other big problem is that, it, and the reason they haven't been done yet, is because both the city and state are reluctant to take on the maintenance and the operational things that it's going to take to be done. So that's, one, that's where we're actually looking at creating a, um, a civic or a community reinvestment district, something like our business improvement districts in Waikiki, but for the whole watershed that will, that will concentrate, create a pr pr uh, private nonprofit that will concentrate on providing that maintenance and that operational support to make it work. And uh, we think that if you add that to uh, the Army Corps plan and some other improvements that we would uh, work to bring about with the city and the state. Uh, we think that we can not only enhance the flood control portion of the plan, but also uh, provide that uh, water quality improvement and environmental uh, improvement throughout the watershed. Now, there's a bunch of federal money that has been set aside for the Army Corps uh, to move forward in this plan. Mm -hmm. Right, there was $345 million that was appropriated. Now that $345 million actually includes the local share uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, it, it is really a uh, proposal that is very f uh, favorable to the, to the local partner because the federal government would front the money and the, the state could then pay it back over 30 years. So um, at you know, low federal government interest rates, if the state can get a better interest rate, obviously they can, they can uh, fund it on their own. But uh, the idea is you don't have to wait for the money to, to, to come out of the state in order to move the project forward. Um, it came in through an emergency funding that, that came out of, the, out of the natural disasters that happened on the mainland. As a result, it's actually moving much faster. It surprised me, actually. Moving much faster than the normal Army Corps process. And as a result, um, uh, the Army Corps is going to begin public, along with the city and state, will begin public outreach soon and to talk about all the details of the plan and could begin uh, some constru construction, some parts of the plan as early as late next year. Well, I'm glad to hear that. As you know, I was the mayor that had to preside over the 48 million gallons of raw sewage that spilled into the Alawai Canal. So I know how precious, how fragile uh, that aspect is of Waikiki. So it's comforting and reassuring to know because, um, you know, the, we all know this, Rick, it's not a question of this, it's a question of when we may be hit with a major disaster, and certainly Alawai could be very vulnerable if we're not gonna take some of the steps that you're working very hard on. And I think that um, the, hopefully all the, the near misses we had this year uh, underlined to everybody in the community the necessity of, of moving forward. Uh, you know, I, there's no such thing as a perfect plan, there's always gonna be things that we don't like about this plan or that plan, but you know, we can't, uh, this is too important yeah. for, for the community yeah. uh, for us not to move forward on it. That having been said, I think we can uh, make some changes that will enhance the plan, mitigate the plan. Yeah. It's always been my position that, um, yes, the flood control is important, but we have to live with whatever we yeah. build yeah. All, 365 days a year. Yeah. And so it should be something that um, creates other advantages for the community and certainly doesn't take away from the uh, aesthetic value that we yeah. cherish. And I think the, the, the lesson here too is to be proactive than, than reactive. When mm -hmm. I was a councilman, I kept saying, you know, that we were doing the nice to have and not the need to have and we neglected 
uh, all the sewage infrastructure. So now the lesson learned there is we basically have come up to speed on it. We've put the improvements in so that, you know, if it should ever happen again in terms of a major rainfall, we won't see that aspect of the city's infrastructure system go haywire as a result of it. And that's exactly what you're trying to do here, be proactive as opposed to it hits and then, whoa, what's the plan? What do we do? Where do we go from here? And that's what we're doing in Waikiki Beach. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, back in 2015, we, we actually created a fund that the city collects for us. So we, we assess all the commercial property, not the residents, the commercial properties in Waikiki, to put into a fund to match state money to uh, restore and maintain Waikiki Beach. Very important. And uh, I think that, um, you know, you talked about safety. The beach is also one of the, the key parts of what make Waikiki attractive. And uh, we did a survey with partnering with HTA a few years ago, and then we uh, updated it recently. And over $2 billion a year uh, of revenue is tied directly to the beach. Okay. Rick, in the minute and a half we have remaining here, talk about what often troubles residents going to Waikiki, and that is there's no parking. You've done some terrific things uh, over the past year and a half uh, working with the city council to bring in some traffic mitigation measures. Absolutely. We, we created uh, something called a Transportation Management Association. They're done all through the mainland. They make them eligible for, for federal funds as well. The long-term idea is to create more parking, and you know, it's to improve the, the access in Waikiki, create more parking, uh, regulate better our loading and unloading, which tends to cram our streets at times and uh, be able to work with the city by creating a, a fund. We're, what we're gonna do is charge the businesses that l load and unload in Waikiki uh, a fee for just for Waikiki, and that money will then go into enhancing Waikiki's ability to handle the traffic. Well, you know, Rick, there's so much more to talk about. Uh, uh, we didn't even touch uh, the sidewalks there and the things that we're doing to keep those uh, areas mm -hmm. there safe uh, for our visitors and our residents alike. So, this is really uh, Tourism 101 with WIA Part 1.